Hello, New Hampshire Realtors. I'm Mark Draper, your 2020 NHJR president. As we continue to navigate our way through the pandemic, both personally and as an industry, I'm pleased to be joined by someone who we all probably feel like we know a little better than we did two months ago, New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. Welcome, Governor. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I know it's a little different, obviously, than, uh, than being able to meet in person and uh, you know, give the give a speech and have the the one-on-one -on -one questions, but just to be able to kind of hear what's happening out there is obviously a, a huge tool and resource for us as we make some pretty pretty tough decisions. I've always said, you know, it was tough to make some of the restrictive decisions, but it's even tougher, frankly, opening things up. But we want to do it. We want to do it right. So getting the stakeholder input from you guys is uh, really important. Great, we're happy to. Well, I know your time is valuable, and we certainly appreciate you sharing a little bit of it with us today. So with that in mind, we'll get right with the questions, if that's okay for you. Sure. Great. Okay. First, as realtors, we thank you very much for making real estate an essential service. I believe New Hampshire is the only Northeast state to have made real estate essential from the very beginning of their emergency order. I know we as realtors share your commitment to making safety the public of our public the top priority. How are we doing as a state in combating the virus? Uh, we're doing very well, frankly. Um, so given that, and a lot of folks have, I don't mean to be repetitive if you've heard a lot of our, our press conference and whatnot, but the reality is, and it is still such an important variable that we are in the Northeast. The Northeast has uh, is at the ground zero of this epidemic. Uh, just yesterday, frankly, Massachusetts reported the highest amount of cases of any state in the country, any state. They are now number one. So uh, while their numbers have gone down, uh, that is just a reality, like literally a mile south of our border, especially for, for those of us that live in Rockingham and Hillsborough County. So our numbers have uh, come down in terms of the percent positive cases. And we look at our percentage because on any day, the number of tests we do could, could vary uh, between 1,500 and 2,500. Uh, so you look at a percent positive and we keep, both, we, we went from about 15% positive down to about five, four, three percent, and we kind of bounce around between three and five percent positive on any given day, which is manageable. It really is because it's all about being able to, if the numbers were to go up or anything like that, can our healthcare system, is it, can it manage it? Can it, is there going to be a bed? Is it going to be a ventilator? Those are the most important things. Remember when we got into this, remember those, those scenes out of Italy and China. That's why we made the restrictive decisions we did because there were literally people that just couldn't even get to a hospital dying in their homes, you know, and that was something that I don't think anybody could tolerate here in, in America. So we made those very, very tough restrictions. That being said, um, we, we continue to do very well. We're clearly on the downside of this, but we are going to be managing through it for a long time. It is not going to zero uh, for, for quite some time. We, we really have to find a way to create these guidances, guidance documents knowing that numbers could go up, surges could happen, but we are gonna create a pathway that we can manage through. Can we get everything open? Probably not, to be honest. Um, ultimately, yes, but, but not any time in the, in, the, uh, in the near future. So we'll keep kind of making some steps, working with public health as best we can to uh, make sure the guidance fits something that's practical, something that's implementable, but, um, but it also allows us to take some steps forward and get the economy really going again. Thank you. The major issue we hear all across the state is the lack of housing inventory. Before the pandemic, New Hampshire had seen historically low levels of inventory. And the situation over the past two months has become even worse. We have many buyers who are looking but are getting priced out of the market due to the demand. And many of those are the types of buyers that we need. They're younger buyers that we need for our workforce. Is there anything policymakers on the local, state, or federal level can do to help boost our housing stock when this pandemic ends? So earlier in the year prior to COVID, we put forth a, what I think is a really comprehensive housing bill that does a variety of different things. Uh, it was put together with a lot of the input from folks here, from uh, commercial developers, from uh, folks at the town and city level, folks uh, at the state level to make sure we're, we're breaking down permitting barriers, things of that nature, allowing things to move forward. And it really creates a lot of incentives, if you will, that hopefully will allow people to do more both single family and multifamily housing for rent and for sale uh, and really uh, address a lot of the, the issues. We are a local control state. So working with the locals has always been our biggest barrier. Um, it's, it's, it's a powerful tool, don't get me wrong. It can work very positively, but it is also a barrier uh, in terms of um, what can and, and could be done. Um, one thing that I, I have to say that I'm very encouraged about is we, we're seeing more and more projects, whether they're on the low income side or just apartments or whatever they might be, that are aesthetically pleasing. They work in the constructs of a small town. Um, you know, I think back that 1980s, 1990s mentality of, well, we don't want multifamily housing here. We don't want a certain, you know, certain types of 
of single family housing here and, and certain types of commercial real estate here because that doesn't fit our mold. But now there's the technology and materials and designs and architecture that can really make it fit the mold. Um, and knowing that a property tax base is important, right? This mentality of uh, the old school mentality of, well, we don't want families with too many kids because that's too much of a burden on our system. The number, one of the biggest issues we're going to be facing as a state, which really affects this group, frankly, is the fact that over time, the number of kids in our school system pre-COVID for the next 20 years is going to keep ticking down two to 5% a year, right? So a classroom of 25 kids today is going to be a classroom of 20 kids in just a couple years. So that has huge impacts on property taxes, huge impacts on how we fund schools, huge impacts on, it has a, a reverberation effect. So changing our model and saying, look, we want families with some kids in them, right? Because we want those folks here to help pay the property taxes and, and you know, at that local level and having the right designs and constructs and breaking down those permitting barriers, I think can, can allow that to happen. So the bill, sorry for the long answer, but that bill that we put forth has four or five things in it that uh, you should definitely take a look at. I apologize. I don't have the bill number off the top of my head. I'll try to get it for you if you don't have it. Um, I know the House and the Senate are each looking at a version. Whether they take that bill up in this new shortened session, I don't know. I hope they do, but I don't know if they will. There was a lot of bipartisan support for it. I designed the bill and got sponsors when I, when I created it with two uh, younger Republican and Democrat members. So we tried to do the bipartisan thing uh, off, the, off the bat. So hopefully we can get there. That's great information. Residential real estate so far has weathered the storm relatively well, but our members and clients in the commercial sector are getting hit harder during the shutdown. I know you created the Main Street Relief Fund to assist many restaurants, retail, and other New Hampshire businesses. How do you see the state's commercial sector recovering? Um, it's going to recover slower than I think you'd see in the housing sector. The, the relief fund, to your point, was really designed um, for the purpose of paying bills, of paying mortgages, of keeping the lights on, paying property taxes, all those basic needs, so that even if your doors are shut, hopefully you're not you know, locking the door and throwing away the key uh, for all time. Um, and so that was really the purpose to allow people to survive. Uh, so now that we're on the, you know, hopefully on the upswing of things, uh, they can start opening those doors, start kind of making their comeback, specifically around restaurants and lodging. But the Relief Fund was created for virtually all businesses. Anybody that qualifies, qualifies, and they all get their pro rata share of money. It's, it's very agnostic that way. But, um, but my sense is, is that given, even if we opened everything up, it's not going to open. And the, look at a mall. Strip malls right now, I mean, not strip malls, but malls, Simon's malls are open. And I've allowed retail to open at 50%. You go into a mall right now, maybe 50% of the stores have chosen to open for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes they have trouble getting their employees back because we all know they're getting $600 per week on top of an, an expanded unemployment benefit at the state. Uh, it's really disincentivizes folks, a great opportunity, but disincentivizes folks for coming back into the market. Um, so that's a barrier that probably won't be hurdled until after that, that federal program goes away on July 31st. My sense is people finish out the summer for whatever that means. And then as kids get back into school, as the universities get back into the swing of things, kind of that New England fall mentality when we all come back from vacation and get into our routines. Now, we're not coming back from vacation, but we're coming back out of this, this weird doldrum of COVID. We're back into our routines. My sense is things start really kicking forward in October, November. We're already seeing some very positive results. Our unemployment numbers are dropping twice as fast as the, country, the national average right now, which is great, right? We kind of went up here and now we're already coming down um, and we're coming down twice as fast as, as the average, which is a very positive sign. But I don't think things get into real kind of advanced gear until probably September, October. And then I don't think things really start coming back like full force until probably early next year. There are certain industries, let me just throw this there, there are certain industries that you think don't affect New Hampshire, but will for the long term. Airlines. Um, the airline industry won't be back for about three or four years, minimum, minimum. And what you don't realize is that while that clearly affects Boeing and Delta and United, uh, it, all affects, it also affects the hundreds of small manufacturers we have here in New Hampshire that make the ball bearings and the switches and the gears and all that for a lot of those parts and components. There's tens of thousands of businesses that get, uh, there's a reverberation there, GE and hooks it or whatever it might be, but also the little guys too. So while our 91% uh, of our businesses are small businesses, they're going to come back, I think, fairly decently. There are still some very large macroeconomic dynamics that are still going to be slow to come out of the gate. 
and still will be lagging uh, across the country. Everyone will be lagging a little bit because of that. Now we're very heavy into aerospace here, aerospace manufacturing. So I focus on airlines and aerospace. Um, but, and I think that's one of the, one of the anchors, if you will, that will still be dragging along here for, uh, you know, probably the next year or two. On a similar subject, we worry about the rising number of small businesses that have announced that they will not be reopening, either because they've remained closed too long or restrictions that they'll have to abide by are too impactful for them to run their business and still cover their overhead. Many of these small businesses own the real estate that they operate in. They've heard there will be bankruptcies following the pandemic. Is there any talk of amnesty or debt forgivenesses for these small business owners? So, uh, I mean, the first step, uh, there's a couple of steps. Um, we, we've worked with the banks to provide a, an opportunity of forbearance for whether you're an individual homeowner or, or a business. Uh, um, the national forbearance average right now is about 8%. New Hampshire, 2%. So that's a good sign. Only about 2% of people have actually asked for forbearance there. Um, so the, ultimately, if that doesn't get, for lack of a term, repaired, if people can't get on a better track, those three or six months of forbearance will, will, will drive them into a bankruptcy or, or true long-term delinquency. And they're really, you know, sharing the doors late, late this year. Our hope is that again, as we start kicking things off in September, October, people are getting back into the mix. And, and again, with the, the Main Street Relief Fund, the PPP funds that have kept a lot of the businesses alive, some other federal programs. Now we still also have a federal stimulus bill that I do believe will get passed. It's not going to be $3 trillion and it shouldn't be, by the way, that's outrageous money and they have all these other random things built in there. But my sense is there will be some stimulus money uh, for the entire country, specifically the state. It's different than relief money, right? That's for construction and business development and, and uh, infrastructure and all those kind of key things that normally drive a strong economy, put, put cash right back into the economy. There's a lot of liquidity out there. Look at the stock market. That isn't plummeting because people know this is temporary and temporary could be three or nine months, but it is truly temporary. There's, there's liquidity and there are good, strong fundamentals. So I do not think we're in a situation, and I think most people would agree with me, of 2008, 9, 10, 11. Um, we are in a, a stronger dip and a, and a stronger rise. And I think you start seeing the, the benefits of that rise on the back end. So right now we don't have plans to uh, extend, um, uh, you know, the, or do additional programs on top of what's already out there in terms of uh, delinquency support or, or forbearance support. I think a lot of the, the banks have taken that on and, and done a pretty good job. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the courts play into this because the courts live under a completely separate emergency order. They don't live under my emergency order. It's weird. They're a separate branch of government. Same with the legislature. I can't tell the legislature when to come and go. They have their own, their own um, uh, you know, schedule. Courts issue their own state of emergency. Now, as they come out of that and start doing more, they've really done very limited um, business of the court. Uh, they'll have to literally schedule and get people lined up. So if people are going to be taken through a foreclosure process per se, it might take a long time to get there. And that can actually be a, of a benefit, right? If it gets dragged out, hopefully more time for the businesses to come back. We just don't know how many businesses have shut doors and how many businesses are going to de declare bankruptcy and how many businesses are going to unlock doors, right? And everything's in kind of one of those four categories. I stayed open and I'm fine. I shut my door, but I'll open it again. I'll shut my door, but I won't close it. I won't open it again. I'm shut my door and I'm going to full bankruptcy. Those all are, are we, we, we're really working with the bankers to get a better assessment, but knowing that only about 2%, we're still well under the national average for forbearance, is probably a good sign that, not that we're free and clear of all this, but it's gonna be less impactful here than it will be in the rest of the country. Interesting. Currently, the state is understandably not permitting rental evictions during the emergency order. And it's important to note that the federal government has also placed restrictions on evictions of properties with federally backed mortgages. How long do you see that prohibition continuing? And what is your guidance for landlords who may have trouble paying their own mortgages or property taxes due to tenants not paying their rent? Sure. So uh, something we looked at very carefully, I'll, I'll answer this. The, um, the uh, ban or the emergency order that basically uh, doesn't allow for evictions, I'm going to likely keep in, in place indefinitely for now. I, don't, I couldn't tell you, I don't have a date when that's going to be lifted. The reason there is, again, the courts, because even if I lift it, I don't think you're going to be able to drive people through a, a, an eviction process. Now, you can still evict for bad behavior. You can still evict for pretty much anything other than pure financial instability. Um, we looked at the delinquency rate of renters pre and post COVID. Pre COVID, it was about 7.2%. Post COVID, it's about 9.8%. 
So it's gone up, but not, not drastically because again, they have so much unemployment insurance. Um, people really can either come work out a payment plan or, or at least pay their rent. Um, so that, that's the, the good news there. And again, our forbearance, the number of people requesting forbearances, which do are, are really more related to a mortgage, not a rental payment, uh, does somewhat mirror that market, that, that low income market. So um, we think that as things come back, we're gonna be in a stronger place. Uh, in def- right now, I, I don't have any plans to lift. I thought I was, but then I, I, when we looked at the data and, and the fact that we could lift it, but not really get any true benefit out of that uh, because you know people, just, it's really hard to take anybody through a foreclosure process or a, a, an eviction process, I should say right now. Um, you know, so we're, it, it's a bit indefinite. Now, if, if there are folks that need cash, if they need some sort of financial relief, if you know, their, their delinquencies are, are much higher than, than you know, the average that we're seeing across the state, there's the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority has opportunities for them to go to. Uh, they could apply to the Main Street Relief Fund because they're a business like anybody else to get some cash help. Um, there's a couple ways to, to go about getting some, some additional cash in there, but we ho- we're hoping again that it's just a temporary situation and uh, people can work out, work out a payment schedule. Great, thank you. Realtors have largely adapted to this new normal and have become innovative in the showing of houses through remote means. I'm always amazed at how fast our industry can adapt to changing conditions. Currently, open houses are prohibited as are client meetings in real estate offices. Do you anticipate those will remain in place until the emergency order is lifted? So uh, I apologize, I, you cut out a little bit there. Are you asking about the, the prohibition on open houses? Uh, yeah, the prohibition of open houses and meeting clients in real estate offices. Yep. So I think I, I, I might be wrong, but I thought you could still do open houses uh, as long as they're scheduled. And, and maybe I'm off there. I, I'd have to, I, I did my emergency order a while ago. So I will definitely look into that. Um, at a minimum, we should definitely be moving to that if we haven't already. And I apologize. I don't know that off the top of my head, but I, I thought you could do at least open houses and meeting within an office uh, structure as well. Again, I'll go back and look, but we, what we'll try to do is at least allow it to make a step that as long as you're, you're setting an appointment, keeping an appropriate social distancing, uh, you can start having those meetings. I think what we're just trying to avoid is situations where you had 20 or 30 people coming in for um, uh, an assembly about a property or 20, 30 people at the same time, just you know, going through somebody's house. But as long as there's a scheduled thing one-on-one, which I think a lot of people can do, um, especially given a lot of the technology, we can definitely make that step. So I'll, I will go back uh, following this. And uh, if we haven't taken those steps, I'll make sure that we, we, we build that in. Great. Yeah, I think what you're referring to, it's called block showings where they schedule people to come through a new listing, but they space them out. Right. Space in between. That's what we're currently doing or we're seeing in the industry they're currently doing. So, oh, okay. But as far as the traditional open house of just opening up the house, people come yeah. in at no specific time. You can I see a number of people there. That, as I understand it, is still prohibited. It is. You're absolutely right. I don't know when we would undo that. Now, it, what we might do is tie that in conjunction, and I'm going to make a note of this. Uh, when we get to the point of doing uh, more than 10 people in a social gathering, technically, I, I kind of qualify kind of that as a bit of a social gathering, right? And so maybe if we expand that to 25 or 50 people or, you know, kind of as we, we open things up, it would probably be a logical step to take in conjunction with that. So that I guess technically that could be as early as the next couple of weeks because my hope is to make that, make that step in the next few weeks. That's a great point, though. Great. We'll look forward to that. Uh, Executive Order 23 allows towns to be relieved from complying with statutory or local deadlines, which is certainly understandable. A concern we've heard is that some towns, but certainly not all, are not even accepting applications for permits. We're not sure if that was the intent of the order, but we're concerned. No, 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 it definitely was not the intent at all. Um, If there are towns that simply aren't accepting permits, I'm not sure what we can do about that. I mean, they they really should be. That's That's a problem. I mean, if there are specific instances, let me know. That was definitely not the intent of the order. I mean, a lot of towns have just chosen not to have their staff back in yet, and, and that's their choice. They can they can do that. They're trying to do as much remotely. I can appreciate that, but um, let, let me look into that one as well. I mean, if, if and if there are specific instances you guys want to send along, let me know. Yeah, we'll reach out to our membership as well and see if they're seeing it happening in any specific communities. Uh, Last Friday, you provided guidance on how lodging, including vacation or short-term rentals, may once again operate. Short-term rentals are critical to many local economies, bringing in thousands of tourists, accounting to an estimated 100 million in, to property owners and 20 million to the state budget. What's your advice to residents as tourist season kicks off and out-of-staters start to return to enjoy everything New Hampshire has to offer? 
so um, we want people to take it stepwise. We want people to be cautious. Uh, if you're coming from out of state, we still ask that you're, you're quarantining. Uh, right now we're just doing in-state rent. Uh, we're opening things up for Airbnb and motels and hotels to, to in-staters. Uh, as most, I think Maine and Vermont are doing are very similar models. Uh, hopefully we'll take that next step to out-of-staters. Right now, if you're coming from out-of-state, we ask that you quarantine. Um, so hopefully as we keep advancing things forward and we can start you know, more encouraging folks from out-of-state, again, I, I don't need me to just keep going back to bad news, but Massachusetts had their highest day ever yesterday, uh, highest day in the country, not their highest day ever, but the highest day in the country yesterday. So, and that's primarily as someone who used to run a hotel, you know, we expected 60, 65% of our business to come from out of state, primarily Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. That's, that was our bread and butter. So um, that's one of the, the big problems. You're really asking to invite that element in here that traditionally we love, but you know, we're not really, we don't really want to make that step today. I can tell you in terms of just general tourism venues, we're going to have an announcement on Friday that talks about expanding more tourism venues. Uh, the announcement on Friday is also going to look at an, an additional step for restaurants. Um, uh, which I think will provide a, a, a lot of opportunity as well. Um, golf courses, you know, looking at allowing folks from out of, you know, golf courses. I know it's not directly related to real estate, but it is rela related to opening things up. Uh, right now, golf courses, we're saying no out-of-staters, but all, the, all states have their golf courses open now. So I'm not as worried about people from Massachusetts flooding in here. On lodging, I am, because they, you, can't, you still can't do lodging in Mass. You can't go out to eat in Massachusetts. So um, those are still the areas we're most concerned about because we don't want people flooding over here trying to get something they can't get in their own state. Lastly, a, re a recent emergency order uh, waived continuing education requirements for all professionals, including real estate licensees, for those that would have licenses that would be expiring in, at the end of 2020. Uh, here at NHAR, we're working hard to ensure our members are kept up to date on changing regulations, orders, and laws, both state and at the federal level. However, not all real estate licensees are realtors and may not be keeping themselves as informed as prior to the order. What went into that decision? So a couple of things. Um, first of all, a lot of the continuing education had to happen in person. That's just how they did it. So we said, look, you could go virtual with it. Uh, and in certain cases, you didn't, you didn't have to do it, at least on a temporary basis. Um, in a lot of cases, we're not saying it, it, should, it can never be done. We're just allowing them to put it off and waive it for six months or, or down the road. So we're not saying you don't necessarily have to do it. We're just allowing that a bit of a, of a waiver. And we do understand that the value of the, the continu continuing as a, education programs to your point exactly, you want to keep up with laws and rules and regulations and best practices, all that, all that really good stuff. Um, but it just wasn't a practical, there was no practical way to implement it, given that we were shutting down schools and, and a lot of the uh, social gatherings or gatherings are more than 10 people. So um, it was just kind of the next step that we saw that had to happen to allow things to go forward, as opposed to saying, we're cutting all the licenses off and we'll, we'll get back to you. We wanted the, the industry to go forward. Uh, take a bit of a, a pause if they could on, on these stipulations so that the, we weren't freezing up the entire market. But mo in most of those cases, you know, you, we're still asking that you do them. We're just allowing that flexibility to do them on the back end. So again, as we move forward, hopefully we can come out of a lot of that and, uh, and get back to normal, whatever normal is. I use air quotes a lot as governor lately because this is all new. This is all very uncharted waters. Um, but that's generally the, the thought process that went in there. And again, we didn't want to uh, take the power away from the, the industries or anything like that to, to not in, insist on that continuing education, but just provide a little flexibility on, the, on a temporary basis. We certainly appreciate your time, Governor Sununu. On behalf of the New Hampshire Association of Realtors, I thank you for your leadership during these unprecedented, unprecedented times. I'm sure this is not what you expected when, when, uh, when you were elected, and, and I appreciate everything that you're doing. Perhaps we can do this again sometime, and uh, please continue to be well. No, thank you. And, and again, just uh, we appreciate the time, just even the questions here, um, just being able to take notes. I'll get back to on the open houses uh, and, and look into the permitting stuff on uh, at the localized level. If, if folks really aren't accepting permits, and by all means, send me any additional information on anything you have. I mean, even if we, we're not doing this every every day, always feel free to send me or my staff a, a, a question. We know it's, it's uncharted waters for me. It's uncharted waters for you, right? It's uncharted waters for everybody. And I got to tell you, I think the state's been doing a great job. I really do. I think the people of the state have just hats off to them. They've allowed us to keep our numbers so low 
given what is happening in Massachusetts and knowing that, look, 80,000 people a day work across our borders in one way or the other. Now, the number of people commuting across the borders is very much minimized right now. Um, but the fact that we are Hillsborough and Rockingham, as much COVID as they have, still are just a fraction of what you're seeing just south of us uh, is, an, is an amazing testament to the, I think, patience and sacrifices that a lot of folks are making and personally and on the business side as well. So there are great fundamentals out there. There's a lot of liquidity in the market. Uh, our economy is, is in a tough shape right now. But again, looking at just some of those key factors, if I may, unemployment is dropping here uh, twice as fast as anywhere uh, as the national average. Uh, we have liquidity. Only, we're only a fraction of about 25% of the average in forbearances uh, in the, in, uh, that people have requested on the national market. And I do believe this is a, if I, I don't mean to extend my goodbye, but one of the other very interesting variables that you guys will really want to look at is the de-urbanization that I believe is going to happen in the next coming, in the, in the coming year. There are a lot of young families. There's a lot of people that say, I love Boston, but I don't need to be here. I don't need to go through this anymore. I love New York, but I was living in the White Mountains of New Hampshire just fine working remotely. So that, that message is really getting out there, and we are the ideal state to capitalize on that from, from a real estate perspective and a business perspective because people are realizing that you can be in tax-free New Hampshire. You're not going to give, you know, is this the last time we're going to face a pandemic in the inner cities? No. Um, this is just really capitalized. On, unfortunately, I love Boston, but it's really capitalized a lot of the um, – negativity and, and the troubles you can get in uh, in those high density populations. And if you just want to be safe and not have the anxiety, why not move 30, 40, 50 miles north of Boston, be part of that community, but do it in, uh, in a place like New Hampshire. I think there's a huge, huge marketing opportunity on the back end of this. And, um, and I'm not, look, I, I don't mind. I'm, I'll be very blunt about it. We're not going to let that go to waste. If there's an opportunity to drive more business, more families, better real estate and, and a stronger economy here, we're going to do it. And, um, and I think you're going to see that all across the country, don't get me wrong, but especially around New England. So look, Ken, cannot thank you guys enough. I mean, we'll be watching those, those market sectors and those, that, that data as it comes in. Is there anything else we can do or should be doing? I know every decision I make is tough. I get it. I'm, I'm ticking somebody. Uh, somebody's getting upset with every decision I make. I get it. I really do. But it's really what we have to do. And we just have to kind of be firm in some of these, these things. And, and again, allow that flexibility to happen slow and steady. I'll work with it in a reasonable way. We're going to come back, but we appreciate it, uh, everyone sticking together with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And if there's anything that we can do as an association to help you, please feel free to reach out. Great. Thank Been you, guys. Great. Be safe, everybody. Thank you.